All right, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whatever time it is, wherever it is that you are. Welcome once more to another live stream of Alexandra Mayer's Live. And today we are going to continue in the dearly departed Shelley Lubin's book, The Truth Behind the Fantasy of Porn, The Greatest Illusion on Earth. We're going to continue in the book by reading chapters 14 and 15. I'll be providing my commentary on those chapters along with whatever other thoughts pop into my mind. All right, here we go. Chapter 14 of Shelley Lubin's book, The Truth Behind the Fantasy of Porn, The Greatest Illusion on Earth. And before I begin, I highly discourage anyone out there watching me to ever have anything to do with the adult entertainment industry or the organized crime groups linked to it because the reality is once you allow that kind of an element into your life, um, it's almost impossible to ever detach from it. It essentially is the manifestation on earth of literally selling your soul. All right, just letting y'all know. Because <laughs> nobody told me, okay? Chapter 14, poof, he's here, is what it's subtitled. I was so bored, I had no car, I couldn't drive anywhere, and I was sick of asking sugar daddies to drive me around. They couldn't keep their hands off of me. I was so sick of men. During my off time, I pulled out my new age books and practiced my psychic techniques. I figured God was trying to talk to me, so I should try to go to the other side. At least that's what the voice told me. I believed in Jesus and God and remembered when Jesus told me I was special. I was only six years old, but I never forgot the vision I saw of me preaching to a crowd of thousands of people. Maybe there was still a chance. I mean, he did just save my life from a near fatal accident, meaning a fatal car accident. And for those of you who are not familiar with Shelley Lubin or this book, um, just pop on over to the main page of my YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Alexandra Mayers, and I have a whole playlist of my commentary on various chapters of Shelley Lubin's book, okay? I got really good at my powers. I practiced them all day long where I sat on the floor surrounded by white candles. I loved candles. Of course I did. I was a creature of the dark. And at this point in Shelley Lubin's life, she's getting into the metaphysical world. She's realizing that she is tapped in spiritually and she's realizing that she can manipulate certain energies. Okay. At first, the voice seemed friendly and I was sure the Holy Spirit was talking to me. Even the Ouija board told me my spirit guide was Jesus Christ. It also told me I was a chosen one and had been given great healing powers. Of course, my ego loved to hear how special I was. From mind over matter to energy manipulation, I used my powers for everything. If I wanted the phone to ring, poof, it rang. If I wanted a curtain to move, poof, it moved. I was moving and manipulating things left and right. In fact, I even poofed my four-year-old daughter who fell over on the other side of the room. Everything in the psychic world came so easy to me. Of course, I was already a master manipulator. After about six weeks of being locked up in a new age world, I finally got my car back and wanted to mess with people's minds. I was also low on cash and needed to pull a few deals. I ended up at a bar in Covina where a couple of bands were playing. Minding my own business at the bar, someone tapped my shoulder. 
I turned around to a tall American apple pie looking guy who asked me if I wanted to play pool. I coolly replied, for drinks, sure. I knew I could beat him. He obviously didn't know who he was messing with. He was just a little boy to me. He looked no older than 23. Probably lived with his parents, I thought. When he popped a quarter in and racked the balls tightly within a minute, I started to worry. This guy was no stranger to the pool table. The hustler in me quickly rose up. I didn't lose well, and I certainly wasn't about to lose to this guy. That's when I started poofing. Poof, I said, while I aimed my hands at the pool stick. He looked at me like I was crazy. I laughed and then made the shot perfectly. This guy wasn't even bothered by any of my poofs. I downed a shot of Bacardi and resorted to other means of manipulation. I pulled my top down. That's when he missed the shot. We ended up downing kamikaze shots, on him, of course. That's when he asked me to play darts. Okay, darts was for nerds. But I was bored. He offered me free drinks, and besides, he was a nice guy. He didn't once talk to my boobs. That was different. And I'm going to interject, and this is a spoiler alert, but this guy who Shelly is playing pool with, later she married, and then later betrayed her at the end of her life, which is sad. The question is why he did, and I don't think we're any of us are going to know that until probably a few years from now. As he was sharing his personal information, which I didn't listen to any of it, I noticed out of the corner of my eye, he was hitting the bullseye almost every time. This guy was a hustler or something. He intrigued me. But of course, I wasn't interested in love or anything. I was interested in his skills and especially his wallet. Maybe behind this smart guy was a rich guy. A diseased prostitute could only dream. Tall, blonde, and not very handsome. He was only 22 years old and worked at a, at a box plant. Okay, he doesn't have money. Forget it, I told myself. Hey, what's your number? He asked me. Um, I don't date for free. I'm a stripper cash only. My eyes zeroed in on his pocket. He realized I was all about the money and so he lied and said he needed a stripper for a bachelor's party. Right, I told him. This little boy would probably pee his pants if he ever saw a naked woman I snickered. I handed him my card just in case he really needed a stripper. 300 an hour, babe, see ya. And I walked out of his life forever, or so she thought. A week later, the phone rang. God, I hope it's not someone from the porn industry, I worried. I answered the phone in a fake English accent. Hello? Hey, um, Giovanni, you wanna play pool tonight? Who is this? I asked in an irritated English accent. This is Gary. We met at the bar a couple weeks ago. And I'm just gonna pause there. Isn't it nostalgic to hear that it took him a week to call her in this day and age that we live in where uh, people just, you know, text like after five minutes after a date is over? <laughs> So many young people are so impatient actually to hear from whoever they go out with um, after the date to where if they had to like wait a week nowadays, I think a lot of young people would have a heart attack. But it took this guy a week to call her. Uh, I, just found, I just find that interesting. Anyway, um, okay, I had to think about this one. Everywhere I went, I met guys. 
I paused a second to try to remember. Okay, I gave up. No, I don't remember you. I went back to my regular voice. I'm the guy you played pool with at Boar's Head and shot darts with. Oh, okay. I think I remember you. Well, it's Friday night. I have to work tonight. I have to work too, he said. I just thought we could hang out a few hours before I go to work at 10. No, not tonight, but thanks. I hung up the phone. I didn't have time for little boys. I needed to make some money. But the guy kept calling me. Over the next month, I told him, no thanks, repeatedly, and that I needed to work. I mean, he could have offered me money, I hinted enough. Finally, on another Friday night, he called me again. So he was persistent. <laughs> This time, I was sitting home alone, tired of trying to figure out if I was officially back in prostitution or not. I hated stripping. I hated prostitution. Maybe this guy called me on the right night. Okay, I'll play pool with you. But you buy the drinks, I told him bluntly. I figured I would at least get something out of it. Not to mention maybe make some deals at the bar. I could pull a trick anywhere. Sure, see you soon. <laughs> he sounded like a giddy schoolboy. What have I gotten myself into, I thought. We met at the bar and the guy totally surprised me that night. Not only did he drive like a speed demon, but at one of the bars we stopped off at, he walked right up to the pool table and lined it with speed. Holy shit, I, ex I exclaimed. Where the hell did you get all that meth? I looked up at Apple Pie Guy in shock. I always have it. You like to fly? Well, of course I like to fly, I thought. I missed my speed. The porn industry was my main drug supplier, so it had been a little while. And when anyone says that Shelly Lubin doesn't know what she was talking about, that little phrase right there, or that little line, the porn industry was my main drug supplier, so it had been a little while, is so on point that it's ridiculous. Any woman or man who's ever worked in the adult entertainment industry can concur with me on that. Because um, when you're in that world, you don't pay for any drugs. <laughs> that's how people get hooked. And that's how they keep you. In that world is through the drugs it's not even the money that leads you to stay there it's the drugs I don't care what anyone says it's the truth Wow I thought that could be the beginning of a beautiful long-lasting relationship if only I had known Gary started coming over with his meth we snorted we talked we stayed up all night and laughed he was really a nice guy. I ne he never tried to make a single move on me. A burned out prostitute could get used to this, I thought. One night he brought over checkers. Um, what are the checkers for? I said with a funny look. They're to play with, silly. Um, I don't play checkers. He laughed and set the game up. When he said he could beat me at any game, that's when he pushed the right button. I was extremely competitive, not to mention a major control freak. No one dared me to a game and won. No one! The creep beat me, and I hated him. Of course, I wanted to play again, and again, and again. No way could I let this guy win. We played gin rummy, five card stud poker, Texas Hold'em, and more. We just played games. It had been years since I played games with anyone. I still hadn't told Gary my past or even my horrible present. I was hoping we could just stay game friends for a while. But one night he came to my house and saw me signing an autographed picture for the security guards. What's that? he asked. Well, um, I was a porn star. Oh, okay. He just walked into the house and set up the checkers. 
That was weird. I marched right into the house and blurted out, Don't you know what kind of a woman I am? I'm a hooker, a prostitute, a stripper, and I worked in porno movies. Unaffected, he asked me, How did you get into stripping? I couldn't believe it. Most men would have asked me to have sex by now. Not Gary. He really wanted to know what happened to me. So I told him how I got kicked out of the house at 18 and wound up on the streets of the San Fernando Valley. I told him a pimp lured me in and offered me money when I was homeless. He was shocked, even appalled by my tragic story. His whole face changed, and he reached his hand out to hold mine. Shelly, that's terrible. What happened to you? I thought I was going to throw up. Oh shit, I thought. This guy actually cares about me. I ripped my hand back. Nervous, I quickly changed the subject and asked him how he got into drugs. Dad and mom were pastors. What? I thought. Gary is a pastor's kid. Yeah, my dad cheated on my mom with the church secretary when I was 17. Our home was never the same. My dad became a sailor-mouthed alcoholic and it drove my family apart. I started doing drugs when I was 20 years old. You've only been doing drugs for two years? Yep. Oh, wow, I thought. This guy is right. I wondered if he still lived with mommy and daddy. Where do you live? I asked. I live with my parents in Chino. Oh shit, I was right, I thought. He lives with his parents. I couldn't believe I let some innocent pastor boy into my life. How did I not see this? How did this get past me? I started to freak out. The demons in me were not happy. Shelly, do you believe in God? Dang, he wants to talk about God. I had a terrible feeling I was being set up. Of course I believe in God. I was raised in a Sunday school when I was a little girl. Something inside of me lit up because I spent the next 15 minutes going on and on about God. It was probably the speed. And then I was in a church play called Pilgrim's Promise. I played Faithful, the pilgrim, who is, in, who is Christian's friend from the city of destruction. Wow, I know that story. You played Faithful, he asked. Yeah, and I even memorized the alphabet backwards when I sang the Z to A song. In fact, God told me when I was nine years old that the guy I would marry would someday be able to say the alphabet backwards as fast as I could. Without hesitation, he reiterated the alphabet backwards. We both just stared at each other. Furious, I stood up and told him to get out. I never want to see him again. I ran upstairs to my bedroom and frantically stared into my reflection in the mirror for some answers. Come on, Shelly, use your psychic abilities. Poof, he's here. So that's chapter 14. And I, I like that chapter a lot because it's about her life, but it's also a bit of a love story. So. Next, we're going to go into chapter 15, but I'm going to take a break and I'm going to look at the chat and see what y'all are talking about or complaining about or, you know, who knows what y'all are doing. Let's see. Why do I always straighten my hair? I don't always straighten my hair, but sometimes I do. I don't chemically straighten my hair, though. I just use a flat iron. That's what Karsten asked. Was Shelly Lubin my friend? Yes. In regards to Ron Jeremy, I couldn't give a fuck. Jack D, it would take your negativity out of my channel. Thank you.
Um, Black Jesus, what kept me actually, well, Black Jesus asked, were you able to date or have a regular relationship while you were in the business? Yes, I was able to date. Would I say any of those relationships were regular relationships? No. But um, what prompted me to move out to Los Angeles was a guy who I met, who I fell in love with. Obviously, it didn't work out. I don't think he gave a fuck about me, to be honest with you. I think that maybe somebody just told him to be nice to me to where I would come out and do the work. But I considered that particular guy to be my boyfriend while I was out there. I don't have anything positive to say about Ron Jeremy. Sorry, I, I don't even want anyone talking about him in the chat. All right, so just give me a moment. I'm gonna take a little break and then we're gonna go into chapter 15 of Shelley Lubin's book, The Truth Behind the Fantasy of Porn, The Greatest Illusion on Earth. All right, chapter 15. It's titled, Invaded by Love. <clears throat> Under no circumstances was I going to marry him. Years and years of buried pain Protected by the rock-solid wall around my black heart, I was impenetrable. Did I say that right? Impenetrable. In other words, you couldn't be penetrated. <laughs> At least not um, when it came to love, or so she thought. I shoved the thought of Gary out of my mind and ran back to the lies and mental illness, the familiar dark world where I felt safe. A world without love and light. I turned off my phone and ripped the curtains closed. I would have nothing to do with him. I went upstairs to take a shower to wash away whatever Gary had deposited into me. The stream of hot water on my face, tears poured out of my eyes. I missed him. The low voice hissed at me. We don't need him. Get him out of your mind. Remember your bottle of Jack Daniels behind the toilet? I grabbed the bottle and guzzled it down. The warm feeling washed over my body and I dried off and collapsed into bed. Shoving my face into the pillow, I cried myself to sleep. Mommy, are you okay? A small voice woke me. Hey, honey, mommy just took a little nap. What do you want? I said as I rubbed my eyes. There's a man at the door with a box. What? I was irritated. It was probably one of my sugar daddies breaking the rules again. They knew better than to come over here without calling. Idiot. Half drunk and angry, I headed downstairs and ripped open the door and shouted, What are you doing here? And before I continue, um, I do want to note that unfortunately after, or I'm sorry, shortly before Shelley Lubin passed on, her daughter, who's mentioned in this book, um, passed on as well. Um, one thing that I've always had a problem with has been people who work in the adult entertainment industry who are parents. I don't think it should be legal for anyone to, who's a parent to even work in the legal adult entertainment industry. The, the adult entertainment industry pimps especially tend to target single moms. And a lot of times the children of adult entertainers wind up getting molested by people in the adult entertainment industry, um, workers, social group, or, you know, just something else bad happens to them. So I just kind of wanted to mention that really quickly because um, something needs to be done about making it illegal for even sex workers in the legal adult industry not to be allowed to be in there if they're parents and they have children in their custody. But anyway, I'm going to continue. The voice behind the box replied, 
I brought you a box of rags. I came over to clean your house. My mouth dropped open. Gary walked right into my world and over to the table where he set down a box of neatly folded white towels. He looked up and smiled at me with a rag in his hand and stood there and stared. Shelly, I feel bad for you. Your house is really messy. You need someone to take care of you. A lot of people have criticized Shelly Lubin saying that her story isn't true, but this is this particular chapter is how I know that she wasn't lying. Um, a lot of times people who are raised in the Christian church are raised um, with the mantra instilled in them that cleanliness is godliness. And it's true. It, you don't even have to be a Christian to follow that ideology. If you want to, you know, at least halfway hold it together in life, make sure your environment is neat and tidy and clean makes a big difference it really does and a lot of times people who are raised within the church when they meet people who have a messy environment they tend to want to clean for them <laughs> I've seen it a lot and I'm actually one of those people who does that then he vanished around the corner and suddenly I heard water running I felt a terrible blow to my chest Pain radiated up my spine, through my neck, to my face and jaws. I sat down on the couch and grabbed a cigarette out of the ashtray, frantically trying to light, light it. I grasped the airy smoke into my lungs. I can't do this, I thought as gray smoke blew out of me. Rocking back and forth on my couch with arms folded around me, a terrible feeling washed over me. I need air, I thought. And also remember her daughter's there, so Gary wasn't only there for her, he was also there for her daughter. I walked outside on the porch, looking around for anything that made sense. There was no comfort, there was no way out of this horrible pain, I couldn't breathe. And that pain that she felt, at least from my perspective, was the realization crashing at her that she had to make a change in her life and she knew that this guy saw it and it was bothering her and sometimes when you do realize you have to make a change in your life physically you hurt sometimes you shut down and I've been in that position a few times in my life every now and then as I continue to move forward actually yeah That'll happen to me. Shelly, are you okay? A figure out of the smoke came towards me. It was Gary. I stepped back. I was desperately afraid of him. Stay there. I don't feel comfortable. Shelly, it's just me. It's Gary. I don't want to hurt you, please. No, back off, I scowled and threw my cigarette on the ground and stepped on it. I ran upstairs to my bedroom and locked the door and hid beneath the bed sheets. Shaking and frightened by the intense pain, I cried out to God, God, take it away. Please, God, take it away. The voices started yelling at me, stupid whore. No one will ever love you. He will use you and hurt you just like everybody else did. Get away from him. Another voice interrupted, Shelly. Be still and know me. Gary has been sent by me to help you. It's time. Time for what? I asked the voice. I waited for an answer, but it was silent. Even the other voices were gone now. I sat up and stared in the mirror at the ugly woman looking back at me. Blonde hair extensions sticking out of my dark roots with dark circles under my eyes. I was a horrible wreck. How could Gary even want to be near such a mess? He would leave me. I just knew it. I had to protect myself. 
I put on my false front face and acted like I didn't care. I went downstairs to end the whole thing. Gary, I... He turned around and with the most angelic smile and perfect shiny kitchen behind him, yes? I was speechless. My heart melted and the evil within me recoiled. He walked toward me, touched my face and kissed me softly. A spongy, warm, sluggish kiss. I wanted to eat his lips. I hadn't been softly kissed by a man in years. Our beautiful kiss ended, and I buried my head in his chest and wept bitterly. Huge tears of shattered years gushed out of my eyes, and the forceful pain of rejection, rage, and hatred rose from deep within. I violently pushed him away and pulled out my hair. I hate you! I hate them! I grabbed the phone and threw it. I threw the trash can. I punched the couch. I spit. I hit. I kicked. I hated them. I hate them. I hate men. I hate all of you. Go to effing hell, losers. I threw my seashell across the room. Gary was shocked but held his ground. Stay the eff away from me. F you, I screamed violently at him. The evil inside of me was so fuming and all hell broke loose inside of me. F you, loser, you liar, I hate you, get away from me. And at that point, just to interject, I personally think that her spirit was fighting against demons and demons were coming through her. And they, and I think Gary, inadvertently kind of did an exorcism by cleaning her house. I know that sounds weird, but that's what I think. I grabbed a knife in the kitchen and fiercely aimed it at him. Pointing at him full of rage, I told him to get the hell out and stay out forever. Get the hell away from me now. Wild strands of bleached hair in my face. I paint it like a, I pant it like a ferocious animal. Shelly, I love you. I love you. I love you. I am not giving up on you. That's what Gary said to her. The knife slipped out of my hand. My body fell to the floor and I wept. His overwhelming love crucified me. It shredded the very core of every deception I held dear and did the unthinkable. It gave me hope. For the first time in over 17 years, I felt hope in my heart. A massive wreck on the floor, Gary held me close in his arms and wholeheartedly prayed. Lord, I ask you to heal Shelly, to heal every wound from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. I know you can do it, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. It was the prayer that changed my life forever. The one that God heard and hell listened to. And the war for my life began. So that's chapter 15 from Shelley Lubin's book. The Truth Behind the Fantasy of Porn, The Greatest Illusion on Earth. I hope that all of you enjoyed it. I hadn't um, reread that chapter before I read it to y'all. I hadn't read that in a few years. So for those of you who are not aware, Shelley Lubin did pass in the year 2019. But... I think her spirit is still with us. She was a very strong woman. Very strong.